A five-year-old boy was asked to say grace before the Christmas dinner. The members of the family sat around the table and bowed their heads expectantly. He began his prayer thanking God for his friends, naming them one by one. He then thanked God for his mother and father, brother and sister, grandma and granddad, his aunts and uncles. Then he began to thank God for the food. He thanked God for the turkey, the potatoes, the carrots, the parsnips, the stuffing, the cranberry sauce, the gravy, even the Christmas pudding. Then he paused, and everyone waited and waited. And after a very long silence, the boy looked up at his mother and said, if I thank God for the Brussels sprouts, do you think he'll know that I'm lying? <laughs> Whatever our own views on Brussels sprouts might be, the memory of this year's Christmas dinner will already be fading. And although some people still have holiday to enjoy, and here in the cathedral, we continue in celebration mode with white vestments and the crib in place until Candlemas. For most people, Christmas is done and dusted for another year. Today is simply an ordinary Sunday, back to normal. And so we come to church almost a week on from Christmas Day, and what do we hear but the story of the shepherds again? Some of us have been hearing this at carol services since about the beginning of December. And then again on Christmas morning, and here it is again, albeit only the latter part of the reading. So what's going on? I think sometimes that when we read the Bible, when we read the Bible is almost as important as what we read there. When we hear St. Luke's account of the shepherds on Christmas Eve, as part of the service of Nine Lessons and Carols, we hear it in a particular way. The context of that service means that the shepherds are encountered as part of the big picture. As, in Dean Eric Milner White's immortal words, we read and mark in Holy Scripture the tale of the loving purposes of God from the first days of our disobedience unto the glorious redemption brought us by this holy child. St. Luke's words gain resonance and meaning from the context in which we hear them. The other passages of scripture, the hymns, the choirs, carols, and the occasion itself. On Christmas Day, we hear the same words, but in a different context. Here they are heard as the gospel at the Eucharist, the good news of that particular day. The act of turning to face the gospel reader on this occasion is very significant. We turn so that we come face to face with our Saviour Jesus, who is born for us, as it were, once again. Today, the latter part of that same reading has yet another resonance. We heard Luke's account of the shepherds' visit to Bethlehem, their encounter with the Christ child, and their return, glorifying and praising God. And we heard this not as a Christmas gospel, but as a post-Christmas gospel. The scriptures never speak into a void, but into a particular service, a particular occasion on a particular day. Other elements work within the service together to provide a liturgical context. And one is the New Testament reading this morning from Paul's letter to the Galatians. This is a short but very rich passage with two important points which contribute to that context. Paul emphasizes first the importance of time. When the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, he writes. That is, in the birth of Jesus, God, who is beyond time, chooses to enter our time-bound world in order to redeem it. And the purpose of this is that we might receive adoption as God's children. In other words, our identity, who we are, is found not in ourselves, but in our relationship to God, whose spirit lives within us. This morning's final hymn amplifies this context still further. Thou who art love beyond all telling, Saviour and King, we worship thee. Emmanuel, within us dwelling, make us what thou wouldst have us be. 
And so the stage is set for the gospel reading to be heard, not only within the context of this particular act of worship, but also within the context of the lives of each person present. On this particular day, as our lives start to return to what might pass for normal, the gospel cries out that here is something which is far from normal. And that was clearly the experience of the shepherds. They had been in the middle of their normal routine, looking after their sheep on the hillside, when they were told by angels, no less, that they would find a child in a manger. They visited and they went on their way full of joy and praising God. But what had changed? On the face of it, very little. They continued to live in an occupied country and continued to have low paid, low status jobs with antisocial hours. And of course, they'd seen only a baby. It would be years before that baby would grow up and could even begin to have any impact on the detail of their lives. Nevertheless, they left the manger praising God because they grasped that something important had happened, that in some mysterious and miraculous way, they had come face to face with the living God, that the birth of this baby was special and that it meant there was cause for celebration, cause for hope, that in the grand scheme of things, there would be change that God, the God of the big picture, of the long-term view, the God of the nine lessons and carols, if you like, had broken into their lives at that particular moment, that life, although it meant going back to the normal, would never be the same again. The post-Christmas reading of Luke's Christmas Gospel points us to the truth that God in Jesus takes hold of the normal and makes it extraordinary. It's relatively easy to catch a glimpse of that truth when we're caught up in the celebration of Christmas itself, but the challenge of the passage of time and the turning of another year is to hold on to that truth and to continue to place our hope in God, who transforms the normal. So what might this mean for us as we stand on the threshold of another new year? The future holds real possibilities which are quite frightening. The events of recent months in the Middle East, the escalating cost of living, alarming levels of poverty, and dare I say it, the lack of moral compass on the part of some national leaders all make for a potentially bleak future. The danger, of course, is that we slip into a culture of negativity and pessimism. Emmanuel, within us dwelling, make us what thou wouldst have us be. But the point of the incarnation, the point at which the shepherds seem in some sense to have grasped, is that God really did break into their time and continues to break into our time. The God of the big picture, the God of eternity, bursts in upon the present moment, upon this moment, and offers to transform our view of God, our view of the world, our view of other people, and of the things which frighten us, everything in fact. Through the birth of Jesus, God not only shares our humanity, but does this, as today's collect reminds us, that we might share his divinity. Through the birth of Jesus, we are drawn back into a proper relationship with God, we become God's children through adoption, as Paul reminds the Galatians, and we have the opportunity to become the people God created us to be. Emmanuel, within us dwelling, make us what thou wouldst have us be. I end with some words by John Bell. And did it happen that in a stable long ago, a weary couple, whom no one seemed to know, should choose a manger, despite the danger, to hold and hallow the Lord below. And did it happen that all of this was meant to be, that God from distance should choose to be set free and show uniqueness, 
transformed in weakness, that I might touch him and he touch me. Amen.